much, Brother Alex. It's a pleasure for me to be here today and to talk to you a little bit about Hebrews 11. It's been a long time since I've spoken in this church, so it'll be a, a fun experience for me and hopefully God willing for you as well. Uh, today, we will focus primarily on Hebrews 11 and some chapters or some verses around Hebrews 11. And does anyone know what the other name or what the common knowledge of what Hebrews 11 is for the average Christian? It's called the Hall of Faith. So in Hebrews 11 is the list of great men of faith throughout the biblical history. And today I'd like to take a little bit of a focus on that. So we can see what these men and women in the Hall of Faith, what their life was like, and can we live a life according to the way they have lived. Additionally, these all, men, all these men and women were fallen, and I'm going to be focusing on particular problems that they've had in their life particular failures, particular doubt, that all of them had, as well as suffering. And we ourselves can hopefully take some courage from that as well. Our key text is, of course, Hebrews 11, uh, 1 through 3. And if, if everyone could just turn to Hebrews 11 for me, because we will be spending the majority of our time uh, in that chapter today. Before we go into Hebrews 11, 1 through 3, I just would like to touch on a few verses prior that I think probably should have been included in the chapter. And it says, Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. Now what is the book of Hebrews? It was written for Hebrew Christians. It was different from all of the other letters written to different churches. You have Corinth. Thessalonica, all these things, all these churches had different um, letters written to them, but this book was primarily written to the Hebrews. And if you look at this book, the word confidence uh, in Hebrew, or in Greek that is, is mentioned four times. Having confidence in what you're doing, having surety in what you're doing. And um, Hebrews was written around AD 70, just before the, the destruction of Jerusalem. And these people were converts from the Jewish religion. They had a lot of knowledge. They had a lot of history. They had a lot of history in the former temple of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses. They had a lot of national pride. And now they had Jesus come into their life. They were converted. But they were starting to doubt. They were starting to lose confidence. They were starting to wonder, you know, Christ has left. It's been... It's AD 70. Where is he? And they were starting to lose faith, lose their confidence, lose their way. And if you look into Hebrews, and I encourage everyone to read all of Hebrews, it goes into the Jewish setup of religion, the temple, the high priest, all those things. And it shows that how the new temple, the new high priest was better and would put an end to all the prior religious forms. So all Hebrews is about is keeping the faith, keeping your confidence. Confidence is written uh, four times uh, for the Hebrew people, the Hebrew Christians. So do not cast away your confidence. 36. For ye have need of patience. Or in other versions it says endurance. That after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while ye that shall come will come and will not tarry. And the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Also, commonly mentioned multiple times in Hebrews, drawing back is a big problem. Sin is not mentioned that much in Hebrews, but losing the faith, drawing back, giving up, lacking endurance, that has big repercussions. For we are not of them that draw back into perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Now we go into um, Hebrews 11, 1 through 3. And I'll talk a little bit about our key texts. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. Substance, also a very interesting word. It's hypostasis in Greek. When we think of faith, how do we view faith? Kind of airy, intangible. What does 
what does hypostasis mean? Uh, they found in many papyrus scrolls here and there all over the Middle East of that time, this word was used, um, and it actually stands for uh, confident assurance. It was used in legal terminology. This word was used in terminology uh, such as a title or a deed. Faith is the title or deed of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith, this word, is as real as anything can be real, if not realer. It was more real the way it was used than, say, the laws of gravity, you could say, the common laws of nature. So our faith can have a reality in our life that is beyond everything we see, beyond everything we know, and it does not have to be something that is airy, blind, ignorant. It is a logical, thinking faith that gives us a title or a deed to something not seen. For by it, which is faith, the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. So it is a firm, solid connection to something that we do not necessarily see or know. It is a connection to a promise. And the word promise is mentioned several times in Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 then goes into the heroes of faith. And I want you to think of these three words, moral failures, doubt, and suffering. All of these people suffered from this. In fact, the more we look at the heroes of faith, you really wonder, do you want to be among that group? Let's go into Abel. Now, the Bible doesn't say very much about Abel. We know his story, we know his life, very few words are written. Uh, Ellen White speaks about Abel's understanding about himself as a newly fallen creature. Man had just fallen. Um, and it, Ellen White says in Conflict and Courage, page 24, that Abel grasped the great principles of redemption. He realized and saw himself a sinner. And he saw sin and its penalty death standing between his soul and communion with God. He brought the slain victim, the sacrificed life, thus acknowledging the claims of the law that had been transgressed. Now, Ellen White speaks of this, the Bible does not speak very much, but we do know that his sacrifice was acceptable. Why? Because he understood his sin. Did he suffer? Yes. We know that he had many arguments with his brother. It says that uh, Cain, the, you know, in, the, in Genesis when it says, you know, the sin or devil desires you and is crouching and ready to jump, immediately after that, it says that Cain and Abel spoke. And then after that, Cain, was, uh, Cain killed Abel. So there was a communication, there was an argument, there was a persecution between Cain and Abel. And eventually, Abel died um, for his faith. Yet it is said of Abel, Hebrews 11, 4, By faith Abel offers unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God, testifying his gifts, and by it... He being dead, yet speaketh. Enoch. Not much said in the Bible about the problems of Enoch, but I'm sure he had them. Ellen White speaks in the Spiritual Gifts, Volume 3, page 55. Enoch was troubled. It seemed to him that the righteous and the wicked would go down to the dust together. He was bothered. It didn't seem fair. Why is it that the righteous and the wicked suffer the same. You'll have successful wicked people, and in the end, they all die. They all die together. You could say that Enoch was troubled and questioning God. He didn't understand. How many times in our life are we troubled? Do we question God? Is it wrong to question God? Is it wrong to say, God, why is it so wicked? Why is it so horrible? Why have my loved ones died? Why do all these bad things happen to me? Yet we know um, from Hebrews 11, 5-6, that by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was found not, and was not found, because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony, 
that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. So was it on anything that Enoch had done, that he had made it to be translated? Well, he had faith, and that was the only way he was able to please God. For he that cometh uh, to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Noah. The further we go on in the Bible, the more documentation we have of the problems that these people really had. Noah, he was a great man. He lived in a corrupt generation. He followed the Lord. He built an ark at the Lord's command. He preached for hundreds of years. Repent. But his generation would not listen to him. What are some of the last writings we have in the Bible of Noah? He plants a vineyard. He gets intoxicated. And he lies naked. He also has problems with his sons. One son in particular, Ham. Big family problems. You could say he may have been a failure as a father. Why is Noah in the, you know, in the hall of faith? Yet it says here, by faith, Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen yet, moved with fear, preparing an ark to the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is by faith. Are we starting to see a pattern here? Do we think that we can be among these people? Can we be among these people of faith? Amen. There are a lot of things in our lives that we do. Good things and bad. And I would say that many times the bad outweighs the good. But yet we too can be among this, this number. Abraham. Abraham had many problems, and there's a lot in, uh, in Hebrews here, Hebrews 11, that talks about his problems and his victories. Twice he comes before a king. Twice he lies to the king about his relationship to his wife. So the first time is in um, Genesis 12, 12 through 13, and he, he begs his wife to tell Pharaoh that she is my sister, so I may be spared. Okay, understandable. Understandable. Abraham was afraid. But a few chapters later, Abraham comes before Abimelech, king of Gerar, and he says the exact same thing to that king. Granted, he has history. Pharaoh was warned in a vision, and he gave Abraham's wife Sarah back to him. Do you think Abraham would have learned his lesson? No? Maybe you could say it was a lack of faith. I don't know. But again, committed the same two major sins twice to two different kings. Additionally, the Lord promises him a seed. What does Abraham do? He takes things into his own hands to have a seed, to have um, a progeny, a generation. At this time, he only had a servant. Uh, the Lord came to Abraham and said, your, your, your children will be as the sands of the sea. Things are not working out. Abraham is old. His wife Sarah is old. And maybe it's a lack of faith in listening to his wife Sarah. And he takes Hagar to have Ishmael. Yet Abraham is still in the hall of faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should, after receive for an inheritance, observed, obey, excuse me, and he went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Interesting. Abraham received a promise. Did he really get the full promise? Did he get the full promise? You know, by, you know, your, your, your children will be as the sands of the sea, and by you all nations of the world will be blessed. By you all nations of the world will be blessed. That means Christ. Christ will come, and through Christ, the descendant of Abraham, all nations of this world will be blessed. So Abraham didn't see. He did not see the full promise fulfilled. But he still looked forward. He had his, he had his deed. 
he had the deed of faith, the title, that he was looking for a city that is not yet known, but that he believed in. Sarah, his wife, do you remember when Abraham is sitting at the door of his tent in Genesis 18, 12 through 24? And the Lord and two angels come by, and Abraham entertains angels for a while. And then the promise is given again that your seed will be as the sands of the sea. And what does Sarah do? She laughs. She laughs because she's old. And what does the Lord do? Sarah, why did you laugh? And then she lies. Lord, I did not lie. Yet Sarah herself is among the hall of faith. She lied because she was afraid. However, uh, Hebrews 11, 11 through 12, through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged or reckoned him faithful who had promised. So despite her laughing, Sarah still reevaluated things and judged him faithful who had promised. All of these people, they may have sinned, they may have had failures, they may have had shortcomings, but they judged faithful the person who promised to them. And that is why they are in this hall of faith today. Therefore sprang there even one, excuse me, therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in the multitude, and the sand which are by the seashore. Again, they never saw this promise fully fulfilled. Hebrews now takes a, a little bit of a detour. Hebrews 11, 13 through 16. All of these died in faith, not having received the promise, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they say such things, they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country that is a heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Interesting. Is God ashamed to be your God? Was he ashamed to be the God of Abraham? Was he ashamed to be the God of Isaac and Jacob? I think maybe at times. But overall, it says here of them, he was not ashamed to be their God. Continuing with Abraham. And we will get an idea of why he is in this hall of faith. If we could open our Bibles to Genesis 22, 1 through 2. We'll also read uh, verse 5 while we're there. We go back to Abraham, and it says in verse 1, And after these things God tested Abraham and said to him, I'm reading out of the English Standard Version for this one, and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. And he said, Take your son, your only son, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him up as a burnt offering on the mountains, which I shall tell you. And then verse 5. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. Now, this translation from Hebrew to English obscures the faith of Abraham. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. If you look at the way the Hebrew was intended to be written, and maybe was lost in translation, you could say, uh, it could go as this I and the youth, we will go yonder And we will worship and we will come again This is how Hebrews can make The claim that it makes In the next verse that we're going to read Abraham had faith That God would restore Isaac to him Even if he is offered on the mountain as a sacrifice And this is what 
this is where Hebrews 11, 17 through 19 comes. You wonder, did they just make this up? No, it was always like that. That by faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, that he had received and promised, received the promises, offered up his only begotten son, of whom it is said that in Isaac shall I see be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence he had received him in a figure. So Abraham had faith, but even though the Lord had told him to offer up his only begotten son, the Lord would make good on his promise, and everything would be okay. Yeah. Ellen White says in Our High Calling, page 191, Abraham's test was the most severe that could come to a human being. Had he failed under it, he would never have been registered as a father of the faithful. The lesson was given to shine down through the ages that we may learn that there is nothing too precious to be given to God. So despite failures, despite lack of faith at times, you could say, Abraham passed the ultimate test. He had faith that God would make good on his own promise. And this is why he is now the bishop uh, of Hebrews 11. Unfortunately, Isaac, we know how sin goes down sometimes to the fourth and fifth generation. He's not very different than his father. He is a liar, just like his father. And he also has family troubles. His sons are liars, contentious, they want to kill each other. One son marries pagan wives. And if we look at Isaac himself, he goes back to Gerar. He dwells in Gerar. And it's the same, the name is the same, Abimelech. It could be like Pharaoh. It may have been Abimelech's son who was also called Abimelech. But he pulls the same trick that his father played on the prior king. He does the same thing and he says that his wife is my sister uh, for fear of his own life. Lack of faith. You would think, you know, growing up on your father's knee, you would hear of all the great things that God has done for your father. And, and, the, and the Lord has made a covenant with you. But still, Isaac does the same thing. For fear of being killed by the king, he lies about his wife Rebecca. Yet in verse 20 of Hebrews 11, 20, By faith Isaac blessed Jacob, and he saw concerning things to come. Jacob, a liar, and a cheat to his father and his brother, scared of his father-in-law sneaking out in the middle of the night. You could even say uh, idolatry. His wives are bringing idols along. Polygamy. Weak father with criminal sons. His sons were out of control. They were going killing whole cities. They were going doing immoral acts with their father's concubine. This is, what kind of a father is this, and why does he belong in this hall of fame? Yet still, Hebrews 11, 21, by faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both sons of Joseph, and worshipped leaning upon his staff. Joseph, tattletale, spoiled, delusions of grandeur, he gets visions, and he tells his brothers and fathers of how they're all going to worship him. He's accused of sleeping with a married woman. That looks bad, at least on the outside. <coughs> Especially if it's someone in a leadership position. He's thrown in prison. Yet he remains faithful. He does not give up the faith. Even though he suffers, I'm sure he had doubt. By faith, Joseph, when he died, they mentioned of the departing of the children of Israel and gave them the commandments concerning his bones. Moses, I can't find too much bad to say about Moses. He was a good man. I, I'll gloss over the murder. We'll ignore that. You could say that after Moses spent 40 years in the wilderness, he really had a good relationship with God. However, time, however, time and time again, when you look at Exodus 3, Exodus 4, and beyond, he is full of excuses. Moses says to God in uh, Exodus 3, verses 11, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And God said, 
And he said, Certainly I will be with thee. 4 verse 1. And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared to me. Exodus 4 verse 10. He says, I am not eloquent. I am slow of speech, slow of tongue. The Lord says, Who has made man's mouth? I have made your mouth. I will put my words in your mouth. And what does Moses say? I mean, come on. I pray thee by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. That other person, that other guy, he will be the one. You will send him, and he will lead the people out. He will speak to Pharaoh. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And then he finally says, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? Do you think the Lord wanted Aaron to be the mouthpiece of Moses? Of course not. Over and over and over again, the Lord wanted Moses to be the mouthpiece of him. But no, because of Moses' stubbornness, Moses would be the mouthpiece of the Lord, and, and Aaron would be the mouthpiece of Moses. Murderer, unwilling to be a vessel of God, having multiple excuses, a covenant breaker, he knows the covenant, the Abrahamic covenant. Yet he's going to Egypt to bring the children people of Israel out to reestablish God's people, and he doesn't even have circumcision worked out, and the angel of the Lord almost destroys him on the path to Egypt. And then you could say he has anger management problems, or even Ellen White will say for his pride, where he smites the rock in the end. He smites the rock in the end, and that denies him the privilege of getting into the promised land. He's denied the privilege of the promise. In fact, you could say Moses was so bad and such a failure that the devil had him marked. The devil had him marked. His gravestone was marked, this man is my man. He, being Satan, triumphed that he had power to overcome Moses with his temptations that he could mar his illustrious character and lead him to the sin of taking himself, taking to himself glory for the people which he belonged to, which belonged to God. Christ resurrected Moses and took him to heaven. This enraged Satan, and he accused the Son of God of invading his domain and robbing the grave of his lawful prey. Jude says of the resurrection of Moses, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending for the devil, contending with the devil, disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuked thee. When Satan succeeds in tempting men whom God has especially honored to commit grievous sins, he triumphs, for he has gained to himself a great victory and has done harm to the kingdom of Christ. Yet despite all of this, so much so that the devil himself marked the grave and put a retinue of his angels there, despite all of this, Moses is in the book of faith, in the, in the chapter of faith. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents. So they had faith, because they saw he was a proper child, and that he was not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he had come of years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction of the people of God and enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater than the riches and treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured, seeing him who is invisible. Have you seen a, a pattern here? All of these people, they're great sinners, but by faith they see something that is invisible. They understand a promise, and they believe that promise maker, and they continue to live in faith, and remain strong and run the race of a Christian. By faith, Israel. Can you imagine Israel? Why are they mentioned in there? They grumble, they complain, they cross through the Red Sea, but then they build a golden calf. By faith, Israel passes through the Red Sea on dry land, which the Egyptians assigned to do were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down to the same Israel, idolaters, 
failures. The first generation had to die in the wilderness. By faith, the harlot Rahab. The harlot Rahab, a pagan, an idol worshiper, a harlot? When you think of the harlot Rahab, does anyone know where she's mentioned again? She's mentioned a couple of times in the Bible. Joshua. But what about Matthew 1.5? Can someone tell me where this harlot Rahab goes? Harlot Rahab is the ancestress of Jesus Christ. And here she is mentioned in the Hall of Faith. The harlot Rahab can make it there. I think maybe we can too. What more can I say, for time would fail me to tell, of Gideon, also lacked faith, needed signs, sets up an ephod, and leads Israel astray, yet he's in here, of Barak, Deborah, the prophet of God, prophetess of God, comes to him and says, go evict the alien armies from the land, and he says, no, I'm doing this on my terms. I will not lead the army unless you come with me. It's not on God's terms. It's on my terms. Of Samson. We know of Samson well. We had a lesson of him recently. Major failures get in the Hall of Fame. Of Jephthah. Does he deserve to be here? He's the one who made a foolish pleasure to uh, a foolish promise to God and offered up his daughter for sacrifice. Of David, a murderer, an adulterer. Does he deserve to be here? Of Samuel. It's hard to find problems with Samuel. But A, the people of Israel came to him and said, your sons walk not in, in your ways, so they cannot be leaders. So he's not the best father. His sons are corrupt. Kind of like Eli. You think you would have learned from Eli. And at times he had lack of faith. The Lord told Samuel to go anoint the son of Jesse. And Samuel makes an excuse and says, If Saul finds out, he will have me killed. So the Lord has to make an alibi story or a lie up for Samuel and say, Go tell the people of that town that I'm coming to sacrifice to the Lord. And then so no one will ask any questions. So lack of faith. Yet we know that he was a great man, he is still listed here. Continuing on, verse 33. Who through faith subdued kingdoms like Joshua and David? Who wrought righteousness like Samuel and Elijah? Who obtained promises like Abraham, Joshua, and Daniel. Stop the mouths of lions like Samson, David, and Daniel. They quenched the violence of fire like the three Hebrew worthies. They were out of weakness like King Hezekiah and Jehoshaphat. Made strong like Samson. Turned to flight the, the aliens. Like Joshua, Deborah, Barak, Gideon, received their dead. Like the Shunammite woman, the widows of Sarepta. They were tortured, like the prophet Jeremiah, refusing and not accepting deliverance. So they refused to give up their, their faith, despite torture, despite humiliation. had mockings and scourgings. They were thrown in prison. They were stoned like Naboth, Jezreel, and Stephen. Sawn asunder like it is believed that Isaiah was sawn asunder by the king. They were tempted, or the other word for that is tested. But what does the Bible say of these men and women? They were destitute, also uh, Wandering around in goat skins, we say like uh, John the Baptist and Elijah. But what does it God say? Of whom the world was not worthy. So of all these sinners, of all these failures, you could say, of all these fallen human beings, 
the world was not worthy of their presence. As I read through these verses, this also, you know, this it was written for the people before AD 70. It was mentioning them. But this, this list goes on. It goes on to the Middle Ages. It goes on to the Inquisitions, Catholic Inquisitions. It goes on to all the people who have lost uh, their life, lost their freedom, all for their faith. Were these people perfect? No. But I think one thing that is the key for all of them is they refused to give up. They endured, as was mentioned at the end of chapter 10, they endured great things for the faith of Christ. So we read, as who, of whom the world is not worthy, chapter four, uh, verse 40, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. What does that mean? Let us turn to Revelation 6, 10 through 11. Revelation 6, 10 through 11 says, and it's talking about the souls under the altar, which we understand to be the martyrs of all time. And they cried, they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, O holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our, avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them, that they should rest for yet a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were, and it should be fulfilled. So it says here that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. They are waiting for us. Amen. Waiting for us to see how we will keep our faith. And though we be sinners, will we keep the faith to the very end? So uh, my question for each and every one of us today is, is can we be among this number? Is there hope for us? Many of us here today may have many sins, many iniquities, but I mean, if we look at the iniquities covered in this chapter, some of them are horrible, yet they are still in the, in the, in the hall of faith. God is as powerful to save from sin today as he was in the times of the patriarchs. Of David and of the prophets and apostles, the multitude of cases recorded in sacred history were uh, where God has delivered. His people from their own iniquities should make the Christian of this time eager. So it's not hopeless. Uh, make the Christian of this time eager to receive the divine instruction and zealous to perfect a character that will bear the close inspection of the judgment. Bible history stays the fainting heart with the hope of God's mercy. We need not despair when we see that others have struggled through the discouragements like our own, have fallen into temptations even as we have done, and yet have recovered their ground and been blessed of God. The words of inspiration comfort and cheer the erring soul. Although the patriarchs and apostles were subject to human frailties, yet through faith they obtained a good report, fought their battles, in the strength of the Lord and conquered gloriously. Thus, may we trust in the virtue of the atoning sacrifice and be overcomers in the name of Jesus. Humanity is humanity the world over from the time of Adam down to the present generation. And the love of God through all ages is without parallel. That's Testimonies of the Church, Volume 4, page 15. So humanity is the same. We were wicked from the very beginning. We are wicked now, yet we can still we can still have faith in the atoning sacrifice of Christ that we too can be in this number. I think that um, Hebrews 11 is probably incorrectly stopped where it is stopped. Let us go to Hebrews 12 because it really continues what 11 talks about. Wherefore, 
Therefore, seeing we also are compassed with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which so easily doth beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. So what does this say? I'll pause here, then we'll talk about the final person in Hebrews 11 in the uh, Hall of Faith, the one that we should all be looking to. So we're running a race. All the witnesses, who are they? Are they those who have gone before us? You could say, but they're all dead. The whole universe is watching this race. The whole universe is watching each and every one of us. And our goal is to lay aside every weight, everything that drags us down. Abraham may have sinned. David may have sinned. Everyone sins. We all sin. But the whole point of all of this is to run the race with patience. Other versions interpret this as endurance. Run the race with endurance. Do not give up. You may have sinned many times, but do not give up. Because in the next verses, it says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So the final member in the hall of faith, I would say, is not a failure. We can look at all these people and the failures that they've had as comfort for us in our daily life. Comfort for us that you know what, we can do this. But ultimately, we need to look forward. We need to look forward to the one who has never sinned, and that is Jesus. And King James here says, author and finisher of, our, finisher of our faith. Another way that could be interpreted is the perfecter of our faith. So Christ not only was the author, he not only was the promise given to all those who came before him, but he is also the perfecter of our faith. That means that he can perfect us into his likeness. And because of his shame, because of his uh, suffering, because of his blood that was spilled for us, we too can make it into the Hall of Fame. And instead of being the Hall of Fame for the fallen, we can be the Hall of Fame for the victors. So my wish and prayer for us today is that we may each this Sabbath day and through the remainder of the week look into our lives, realize the points where we have fallen, and see that, you know what, other peoples have gone down this path before us. If you look, just thinking of my mom here now who's going to her parents, these are people who are about to be enrolled. Are they perfect? They're not. But they have had a faith that they keep. They have kept her all their life that they would see Christ again. And will we do that too? That is my wish and prayer for all of us. Thank you. Let us kneel down for a quick prayer, and then I think we'll have a closing hand.